Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you very much to everyone uh, for joining the Eurogen webinar series. So just before we get started, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to explain a little bit more about what a European reference network is and does. So Eurogen is one of 24 European reference networks created by the European Commission in 2017, and it's kindly funded by them. And the reference networks cover most medical fields and Eurogen deals with um, rare urogenital conditions, uh, diseases and highly complex conditions. And it's really focusing on highly specialised surgery where the expertise is rare. We're currently a network of 52 healthcare providers in 20 member states. And the aim really is to deliver quicker specialist evaluation and more equitable access to high quality diagnosis, treatment and care for patients with rare urorectogenital diseases and complex conditions. So some of our activities, as I hope you noticed from the slides at the beginning, we provide virtual consultations using a secure IT platform so that we can conduct cross-border MDTs. So our experts can provide you with uh, um, advice um, if you have a particularly tricky or difficult case. And this is free of charge. We also collaborate on training and education activities, and at the moment we're currently writing a book on rare and complex urology. We also have a Eurogen patient registry, um, and this will be very exciting and important for future research, and it will also feed into future guideline development. So the webinar this evening is our uh, follow-up in spina bifida and neurogenic bladder in children. It's supported by the ESPU, which is a non-profit society whose main purpose is to promote paediatric urology, appropriate practice, education, as well as exchanges between practitioners involved in the treatment of genitourinary disorders in children. So we have a fantastic trio of presenters this evening. Um, the first is Dr. Nina Yunusi from the Centre for Paediatric Adolescent and Reconstructive Urology in the University Hospital of Mannheim in Germany, which is one of our members. And her main interest is transition in paediatric urology, neurogenic bladder, hyperspadius, mega ureters, UPJ obstruction, Lutz and Luto. And then we have Dr. Bernard Hyde from the Department of Paediatric Urology in the Hospital of Sisters Charity Ordens Klinkum Linz in Austria. And his main interest is BUR, hyperspadius, transition in paediatric urology, neurogenic bladder, UVJ, UPJ obstruction and PUV. And then finally, uh, last but not least, we have Professor Raymond Stein, also from the University Hospital of Mannheim. And again, his main interest is paediatric urology, neurogenic bladder, bladder extrophy, urinary diversion, PUV, hyperspadius and DSD. So a thank you very much uh, to all three of you for sharing your expertise here with us this evening. And we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Darren, for the opening and, um, of course, for the opportunity doing this webinar with Eurogen. And, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to start the webinar speaking about conservative therapy and its limitation in neurogenic bladder. I have no conflicts of interest. Sorry. And um, regardless of the underlying disease, the medical care of children with neurogenic bladder requires an ongoing multidisciplinary approach and therapy is primarily based on the form of bladder dysfunction. Um, as you all know, we distinguish four different types of neurogenic detrusor and as well sphincter dysfunction. And these pose less or more serious risks to renal function if successful treatment is not provided to these children. According to the international guidelines, the main goals of treatments are, of course, the protection of the upper urinary tract and um, so prevention of urinary tract deterioration and as well achievement of continence at an appropriate age. 
and improvement of quality of life consequently and restore, uh, restoration and maintenance of the function of the lower urinary tract. Considerations in addition to costs and in vitual complications is it, um, it is imperative to consider as well physical limitations such as those present in most of our young patients. And in the end, our main goal should, beside protection of the urine tract um, um, deterioration, shall be prevention of the need for far-reaching surgical treatment. Besides um, medical education, there are some therapy and treatment concepts. And in the following 10 minutes, I would like to focus especially on intermittent catheterization and medical therapy. Clean intermittent catheterization is an important pillar of conservative therapy and especially the early establishment for all types of bladder dysfunction is necessary because starting CIC soon after birth has been shown to be beneficial in terms of prevention of renal damage and, um, as of course, um, to prevent the need for surgery. In addition, early in initiation of CIC in this period makes it easier for the caregivers to master this procedure, as well as for the children to accept it as they grow older. Because unfortunately, according to the recent literature, it is ultimately the case that most of our patients, up to 90%, will undergo or need um, CIC for their treatment. The caregivers and the patients should be instructed by our urotherapists, um, and sterile or hygiene disposable catheterization should be performed. In this regard, it is important to note that there is currently no evidence that the incident of UTIs is influenced by the use of sterile or clean techniques, and there is no data regarding the coating of the catheters or the multiple use of the catheters. But what is really essential is that we use latex-free materials due to the increased incidence of allergies in our patients. We have the option using overnight intrealing catheters in case of reduced compliance or chronic kidney disease, um, especially when polyuria is, um, is a problem and it prevents the um, increased pressure, especially in the second half of the night. And so it usually leads to a reduction of ascending infections. And for the drainage, we can use bag or two diaper system depending on the age of um, our patients. Complication and important facts to know is that um, um, uterinic, uterine, urinary tract infections and uterine, uh, urethral injuries can occur, but they are rare, especially after specific instruction and sufficient training of the caregivers and the patient. If possible, we should avoid permanent suprapubic or transuteral drainage and we as well should um, not perform bladder emptying using Credit or Salva Manova anymore because this often provokes a damage to the urinary tract due to the high pressure and, it, and bladder ruptures in rare cases can occur as well. So another important pillar of conservative therapy is medical therapy. And I would like to talk about this um, beginning now. And um, here I would like to start with the anticholinergics. They reduce um, and prevent detrusor overactivities, as all of you know, and consequently lower the intravesical pressure and um, increases the compliance. The first line therapy in most countries and according to the guidelines is oxybutynin. It can be applied orally, intravesically or dermally. And in intravesical administration, it comes to a significant higher bioavailability due to the circumvention of the first pass effect. Furthermore, um, as it seems that there is a local influence of C fibers as well. 
It is essential and crucial that uh, we inform, detailly inform the caregivers and the patient about the effects as well as uh, the side effects. And in most countries, um, besides oxybutynin, there are some more medications who are in off-label use and other types of administration can facilitate the um, administration like using suspensions, capsules or suppositories. The following is an exemplary list of some anticholinergics routinely used in um, the treatment of neurogenic bladder with the dosage and the side effects. As I told you, oxybutynin um, is the most um, recommended and used. And depending on the home country, it must kept, be kept in mind that most of the anticholinergics besides oxybutynin are off-label use, and it must be explained to the caregivers and the patients. Um, in Germany, for example, the last one, solifenazine, um, is also approved for the treatment of neurogenic bladder from the age beginning two. And the third one, trospium chlorid, is a quaternary amine unlike the other agents, um, and therefore it's less likely to pass the blood brain barrier and so causes fewer central nervous side effects. Limitation of this medical therapy um, is therapy resistance or intolerable side effects. So um, we can combine substances. This could be an option to reduce side effects or to um, optimize therapy. And an important innovation um, is the use of beta-3 antagonists, as mirabicrone is one of these. It's very selective. And this drug is already routinely used in adults with overactive bladder due to its low side effects. And in some recent studies in children, um, mirabicrone has already been used effectively as well as safely as an adjuvant. And this will um, have an important role in the future, I think. The last important thing is the um, installation of oxybutynin application in therapy resistance using onabutulinum toxin A. Um, depending on the body weight, you, uh, you normally use 10 to 12 units per kilogram body weight, up to a maximum of 360 units, and the duration of the effect is normally between 3 and 12 months. Injection of the Botox into the urethral sphincter has been shown to be effective as well, but should only be considered as an alternative in refractory cases due to the lack of evidence so far. Furthermore, you can use alpha blockers. In Germany, for example, they are not approved for children, and this is something you have in form and the caregivers um, about and we normally use tamsulosine or doxazosine and they can facilitate the voiding in children with neurogenic bladder and it's quite well um, tolerated by um, the children but actually at the moment there is little evidence existing regarding efficacy. Concerning antibacterial therapy and prophylaxis, um, low compliance of the bladder, vesicoureteral reflux and detrusor hyperactivity are risk factors for the development of especially fibri urinary tract infections. But at the moment, um, there are no recommendations concerning the routine and mandatory continuous antibiotic prophylaxis in these patients but it is recommended for vesicular urethral reflux with recurrent infections. You have to discuss it during the training of CIC to, pre to prevent infections, which are quite common in our cohort. And what is really important is that we should not treat asymptomatic bacteria in these patients. We should not do it in any patient, actually. We can as well try to eliminate predisposing factors as constipation or residual urine and urotherapy plays an important role in, in prevention of urine tract infection as well, especially regarding the bowel management and the education regarding drinking behaviors. We can perform circumcision if necessary and we have the option of adjuvant therapy with cranberry 
substances, demonoses or vaccinations. And something uh, which uh, is often forgotten but still sometimes useful is the intravesical application of gentamicin. Um, we usually use one vial um, with 120 milligram in 250 ml saline and instillate uh, 30 up to 50 ml depending on platter capacity. Other important topics are um, urotherapy, of course, general um, as well as specific urotherapy. I already mentioned that bowel management is really, really important for these patients, for the bladder, bladder activity, for the prevention of urinary tract infection. We can use pelvic floor or biofeedback training, but we have to keep in mind that in neogenic bladders, this actually plays a quite minor role and um, the quality of of life often is really impaired by the incontinence and in conservative therapy we have just the option um, offering um, a, um, an optimal pet supply or using urinal condoms and we really have to educate um, the, our patients and give social support for our patients regarding how to, they can deal with this quality life quality of life limitating circumstances and um, other issues, especially when it comes to adolescence concerning developing sexuality. So my take home messages shall be that we um, should proactively and early establish intermittent categorization in children with neogenic bladder. Anticholinergics effectively reduce bladder pressure we have to inform the patients and the caregivers about the um, severe side effects. General antibiotics is obsolete and general and specific urotherapy is also important for our ther conservative therapy, especially concerning the bowel management. And in case um, of therapy resistant, an early escalation should take place and if necessary, surgical treatment should be initiated. So thank you very much for your attention. Good evening from Linz. Great that so many of you can be here. I would like to further dwell into the follow-up for those patients. Um, so actually the care for these patients is a great story of success because whereas in the 40s and 50s, 50 to 60% mortality often in young ages was caused mainly by urological and nephrological causes, only, but still, 7.6% of these um, patients die from medical causes early in their lives, but uh, barely caused by any urological or nephrological causes. So um, our focus in follow-up is to safeguard their kidney function. And there is a lot of work still left to do because 40% of adults with um, neurogenic bladder and thing disorders suffer from some kind of renal insufficiency and um, end-stage renal disease has an incidence uh, of about 1.3%. Also, um, there is much work to do uh, regarding continence and quality of life because blood and bowel related quality of life of these patients still is low. Um, they're limited in their mobility and um, they have a much higher health service usage than other patients. And it has been clearly shown that those patients profit a lot, as Nina already mentioned, from a proactive approach. So we have to early detect um, potential risk factors and problem in order to address them in, a, in an individual way and then pave uh, the, a way to, to, to the best possible management strategy for these, uh, for these um, patients. Urology, uh, in this respect, also because of historical reasons, as mentioned, is often at the center of organizing this follow-up. However, it has to be an interdisciplinary approach involving orthopedics, neurosurgery, endocrinology, psychology and psychiatry, and uh, gynecology and obstetrics as well. But we as urologists often are um, organizing all of this and um, are mostly the most um, regular um, follow-up partners. And follow-up differs a lot throughout um, different age groups. 
uh, in newborns and babies, uh, we have to address whether immediate action is required. For example, if it is a very high pressure bladder, a vasectomy can still be required in some of these uh, children. And then as a part of a proactive approach, we can start with the basic therapy. Um, we can help the families adapt to that situation and um, we should connect to and inform the family about uh, the perspectives involved with these malformations. Actually, we do that often be, even before birth because many uh, spinal abnormalities are detected already early in pregnancy. And we can establish contact to networks and peer support groups um, exemplarily. And I think those uh, groups exist for every country. I would like to mention the ISPH and the SPHO, which are doing a great work. In childhood, um, changes to the urodynamic situation are quite common and it is important to detect them early. It's important to address UTIs and uh, to prevent UTIs and continence, which is of course not so much a topic in earlier ages, becomes important. I also would like to stress that bowel management can change a lot about the quality of life, but also about the UTI frequency and uh, the continence of those uh, patients. Also, we should control for adherence and effectiveness of therapy. And um, in this age group, the patients have to be empowered to take over their care themselves, which is a challenge often in those families. Throughout the transition to adulthood, sexuality, fertility, and renal function become more of a concern um, as well as especially in patients who have undergone reconstructive surgical interventions, the screening for malignant disease, metabolism, and endocrine, endocrine function. As there is a very high dynamism in the cause of bladder emptying problems in newborns, babies, and throughout childhood, with over 30% of all relevant changes during the first year of life, um, urodynamic uh, ex exams are actually at the core of follow-up. From birth until 6 to 12 weeks of age, the main questions are, is there an upper tract risk? How does the bladder wall behave? And is there a need for immediate intervention? So we do a urine test, sonography, um, immediately postpartum, and then the renal function is assessed. assessed and um, I would like to advocate for early video urodynamics, uh, mostly, and for those who had a prenatal uh, surgery in the very common case of myelomeningocele prior to dismissal to home after intrauterine surgery and six to 13 weeks after postnatal surgery. Um, why? Because um, as Nina already mentioned, in this patient group, 88% will develop a relevant neurogenic bladder emptying disorder and about over 50% in spina, cases of spina bifida occulta and intraspinal lipoma. So they profit with a very high probability of an early intervention and of an early detection. And ultrasound clinical symptoms, as well as anatomy and the level of, of spinal lesion has, has a very low sensitivity to determine who is not um, concerned by a bladder emptying problem. So only early detection with urodynamic exam uh, can assure for proactive uh, intervention and an adequate protection of the bladder and the upper urinary tract. And what can we do? If we know about how the bladder behaves, we can start an anticholinergic therapy, we can better plan further follow-up, we can timely start CIC, and in the few cases where it's needed, for example, in high-grade VUR, we can start an antibiotic prophylaxis. In case of unclear, videodynamic results that are common um, in this age group, of course, then it's always better and um, we also do that in our routine clinical practice to start with CIC and then the cholinergic therapy if there is any um, sign of the true overactivity and stop it if you're sure that it is not needed later on. So these are two examples of early video dynamics with one finding which is uh, completely normal on the left and on the right side a finding where you can clearly see the true overactivity um, that profits from an anticholinergic um, treatment. Both um, readings feature also some artifacts as usual in this age group. 
and both radiographs are not really telling you a lot but still this is information you cannot get uh, otherwise and it can direct uh, therapy. There is also a very interesting scientific project in the United States dealing with the question of how you can really tailor early urodynamics and what parameters are really important and that's the umpire study, the urological management to preserve initial renal function for young children with spina bifida, uh, which is centering uh, on which parameters are really important in early video dynamics. And in an audit of many large centers involving a lot of uh, video urodynamic exams, they identified the chooser leak point pressure and filling pressure the presence of the chooser overactivity and the compliance as the most important endpoints in video dynamic exams early after birth to um, determine which bladders are hostile, intermediate, or safe. The chooser sphincter dyssynergia was removed from this from these criteria as it didn't prove to be very reproducible in this age group, but uh, the other four. Uh, should be in the center of our attention. In further childhood, um, follow-up should be individualized and risk adapted. In Linz, uh, we are doing video urodynamics twice in the first year of life and thereafter we do sonography, history, including a catheter diary and urine diagnostics every six months and uh, video urodynamics, blood pressure measurements and renal function tests yearly. It is important to assure for child-friendly conditions if uh, with the urodynamics or urodynamics are done because um, these children will undergo a lot of these exams and uh, to use only radio radiography and ionizing radiation if really required. What we can find is either quite normal video urodynamic findings with, sorry, with leakage early on at low pressures, sorry that was not intentional, like in this example, reduced compliance, which is a relevant finding and uh, corresponds to this radiology image. Also very high leak point pressure and this uh, to demand intervention and the chooser overactivity, which usually is rhythmic and uh, is an indication for botulinum toxin therapy or an anticholinergic therapy. But this can only be determined if measured. Also, I would like to empathize, as Nina already did, by the importance of a continuous urotherapeutic care, including a bowel management, for example, in the SPA, so in the Spina Bifida Association, the American patient group a register, less than 30% of adults are perfectly continent of feces. And we know from literature that this can be much improved by um, optimal bowel management. And management should be interdisciplinary also in childhood and often your urologists are in the lead. Adolescence is a difficult time and um, the patients in this um, age group require very close monitoring. On the one hand regarding the compliance to the important measures like CIC and if they had a reconstructive surgery, um, bowel fl uh, bladder flushing, and uh, bladder care and also renal function. And of course, we have to bring up uh, the topics of sexuality because um, sexual concerns are much more common in spina bifida patients and patients with neuro neurogenic bladder emptying problems. And um, it has been shown repeatedly that they are not really well addressed. Apart from sexually transmitted diseases and um, human papilloma virus, it is really important that we actively address contraception, incontinence during intercourse, precursor puberty, fertility and pregnancy in girls, and um, the issue about beta HCG tests after augmentation surgery that can be uh, false positive in these cases. And uh, for boys, um, a current study organized by Dr. Yunsi is looking into the incidence of ED in, in the context of hypogonadism, uh, which is relevant in this age group, uh, in, this, in this patient group, not only for um, neurological reasons, 
and we should actively approach uh, patients to, to address these issues because they can be treated and with treatment we can help the patients a lot. Also, we should screen for malignant disease, especially after reconstructive surgery and in adolescents, transition should be prepared. There is no age cut off for starting this, but there are questionnaires like, for example, the transition readiness assessment questionnaire track uh, that can help to determine when a patient is really ready uh, to transition. And then transition also has to be a multidisciplinary pro process. Before I conclude, I would like to um, say something about renal function measurement because um, usually we use creatinine, but especially in patients with low muscle mass and um, varying muscle mass, cystatin C is um, probably much better. And this, of course, concerns many of our um, neurogenic bladder emptying disorder patients. I usually use those calculators that can display um, a lot of those formulas at once, and then you get very quickly an impression whether it pays off to uh, look after renal function using cystatin C or whether creatinine might be uh, the, best, the better way to go. Also, um, I believe that DNSA scans are important for this patient group um, because they are prognostically relevant and um, in a study by, published by Ima Moore quite recently, he found that 30% of positive findings were in adolescents without any history of um, UTIs, and those positive, positive findings did cor correlate with um, impaired GFR and higher blood pressure. Although there is no clear guideline recommendation, I think this is something that should be done with any least doubt about renal function, because uh, as said at the beginning, there is much work left to do concerning renal function preservation. Also, uh, in, there are hints that screening for proteinuria makes sense in order to preserve renal function, and of course, blood pressure measurements, especially in those with known um, DMSA changes or renal function impairment. I would like to conclude that proactive management is the aim of any follow-up in urogenic bladder emptying disorders, and urodynamic exams are key to early identification of risks and tailoring of an optimal treatment plan for each patient, and interdisciplinary management is mandatory in this patient group until, during, and after transition as well. Thank you for your attention, and um, I would like to endorse the guidelines for the care of people with spina bifida by the SBA. You can download them freely from the Spina Bifida Association for further reading. Uh, it's really a great piece um, of literature. Looking forward to Raymond's lecture. Goodbye. So, so after all these things, what happens when the conservative treatment fail and surgery is not here? It's not all about better augmentation. I will have no conflict of interest. When you go for bladder augmentation, you can use all these segments from the gastrointestinal tract. Also, you can use ureter. And the main goal is to increase capacity and lower the pressure in the bladder. You can use also tissue engineering bladders, artificial material like SIS. But I think this is still very experimental and should be done only in controlled studies. But in all, when you have a bladder augmentation, CIC is required. When you do it, you have to open very widely the bladder, and you can use ileal segment as an S or a uh, U shape. Also, you can use a sigma, but you have to be informed your patients that within the next 10 years, you have a revision rate of 10, 20 to 36%. So almost every third patient will have a reoperation within the first 10 years. When you think about ileum or colon, yeah, everything has its advantage and disadvantage. Ilium is more compliant than colon. Ilial has less contractions than colon. Colon produces more mucus. Colon is, however, very related near to the bladder. So sometimes if you have a severe scoliosis, you don't get ilium tension-free down to the bladder. So you use colon segment or sigma segment. Uterine reimplantation, it's easier to do it in the sigma. 
metabolic acidosis, it's more common if you use colon segments. Bile acid, it's only resorbed in the ileum. So, and vitamin B12, it's only also resorbed in the ileum. So everything has its advantage and disadvantage. The idle thing would be the ureter, but you can use it more or less only when you have a really dilated ureter and a non-functioning or poorly functioning kidney. But this is still the only patient where I was successful with augmentation of the ureter in a neurogenic bladder. And you have to think about a re-augmentation rate in some papers, about 80%. So you have really to do a very good patient selection. The other option is not to do bladder augmentation, but to do a partial diffuserectomy or the, or the diffuserectomy. And there are a lot of contradicting publications. And recently, Pesco and Lottmann published a meta-analysis showing that the compliance is increasing in 50-50%, or the capacity is also increasing in 65%. So this is relevant. So, and the idle bladder where you can do this is those who have a good bladder capacity, really, which is much more than 50% of the age-related bladder capacity. And these bladders augment the trusermiotomy or the trusorectomy. Former days, it was used as a, a bladder auto-augmentation. Um, this may be an option. But what to do if you have a sphincter insufficiency? There are a lot of things you can do. You can do an original lengthening, to produce in the end a narrow and long urethra. You can use a flat belt mechanism, which increase the resistance, or you can use in suspension or external compression of the urethra, like slings or artificial urinary sphincters, or you can use sparking agents. Everything uh, has its advantage and disadvantage and its success rates. Bladder neck reconstruction and urethral lengthening. It's described by Young, Dees, and Lipitor mostly in bladder extrophy patients, but you can use it also in neurogenic bladders. And here are some results which are quite poor. Only 50 to 80% of the patients may become continent, and you see the low numbers in these publications. You can use it as a flat me mechanism. This is something which Grob uh, first described, and PP Salitis did another technique. Uh, Marty Coyle used it without reimplantation of the ureters. So there are some ideas, new ideas, newer ideas. But when you look at the results, you have a quite high rate of reoperations. And almost patients have some problems with CIC problems. So it's better to use a, a Trophanov stoma in addition to this. Looking for slings. You can use it as a free sling with a double thing, or just put it here. Or you can use it as a vascularized sling, whatever vascularized means, but it's still fixed uh, at the um, muscular rectus, so you have to put it here. And when you look at the continence rate, it's in some reports 100%, but to be sure, you never have uh, you never have 100%. But you use the CIC. And you have a reoperation rate of less than 15%. Using the artificial urinary sphincter, there's nothing new in the last 20, 30 years. You can become continent if you have a really good indication. Most patients need to do additional C a CIC. More than 50% have a augmentation rate. And when you look at the complications, renal function is decreasing in 15%. We have the high risk or a risk of sink erosion, and when there's a sink erosion, you have to take out everything. And sometimes you, especially also in females, you ruin the whole sink mechanism. And when you wait long enough, then you have a up to 100% revision rate, or it's not a revision. You have to prepare one or the other part of the artificial uh, sphincter. Bulging agents or something for a very short term of success. Only 10 to 20% may have a success in the longer run. It's not long run, longer run. And mostly it's used now dextrohyaluric acid, which is deflux or uh, dexel today. 
you can put it here, you can do it transversally or through the stormer and put it from upstairs, but it's a success rate in the end. So, but it's something if the patient wants to become very dry or drier for a short moment, then this may be an option. When you look at the meta-analysis and of the published results, you see that there's nothing idle with these things. And 10 years later, Dave and Curie published another update of this meta-analysis, and you see still there are not the idle things, but the uh, uh, success rates become a little bit more maybe honest when you say so. So it's around 80, 60, 70% may become continent with some of the things. And here is one of the recent publication, to be an honest one, where you see that half of the patient become dry, most half of the patient become dry, and in the rest they stay wet. So, what to do? And if you need to see a platonic closure, or you have to do a supravesical urinary diversion if you have a really insufficient sphincter. Platonic closure is one of the last resorts, and everybody may think. This is very easy to do, and it's then if everything is dry. When you do it, you have to have a, also a continent cutaneous a channel to for the catheterization. You can use the appendix or a Monty procedure. When you do it, you have really to close it very meticulously. But still, when you look at the few publications concerning only a platonic closure in neurogenic bladders, then you see that you still have a revision rate between 17 and even 82 percent. So it's not so easy. And when looking at continents, 80 to 90, 100 percent may become continent at these continents and you have fistulas and also the multi channel may be not so continent. What are the pros for letter neck closure? You don't, in contrast to uh, urinary diversion, you use part of the bladder, you use less bowel. You don't need a ritual reimplantation because when you do a supravesical uh, urinary diversion and you reimplant the ureters into the bowel, especially in neurogenic bladders, you have a reimplantation rate of 10% or more because usually when you'd have to do this, this ureter are already damaged and warped. But when you do a bladder neck closure, then CIC is absolutely mandatory and you have to have very good compliance from the patient as well from the bladder, either through augmentation or you have to have a very good bladder either way. In Mannheim, it's the first thing we do a sling in those who is urgent incontinent in the females. In the males, we do it together with a bladder neck reconstruction. Most all of them get an augmentation and especially the boys, all of them get a Mitrofanov stoma. And we have a persistent or improved incontinence in around 20%. And these patients, when they're really compliant with CIC, we offer them a platter neck closure. So far, we did five of them. So far, we had no complications. But it's really only done when the patient is very compliant with the CIC. And we have a lot of patients who are happy to have very approved incontinence, but not completely incontinent. And they tell us when they are not compliant with this, then they have a leak point and they leak, and then they are, can remember that they have to do the CIC and don't want to have the whole system closed. Looking at the stomas, when you create a stoma, you have been up to 30% a revision rate in the next 10 years, shown very nicely from the group of um, Indianapolis. So we have no real idle stomas. The appendix, the ilium, the ureter, mostly the appendix is used, but you have a lifelong risk when you look at this for problems. You have to know as a surgeon different techniques. And if you have problems, you need solutions which be adapted to the patients. And you have a lot of opportunities how to solve problems when it comes to stoma problems. The stomatognosis, you can do an endoscopic treatment and you create, you incise the scar and you create new scars, or you can do a definitive treatment where you really excise the scars and readapt the bowel 
to the skin. But I think the most important thing is that you can prevent it, use CIC with jelly, use hydrophil catheters, and use, especially at the beginning, ACE stoppers, which keep it open. Stones, in the earlier days, up to 50% of those who have an augmentation developed a stone within the next 10 to 15 years. In the heterotrophic part, it was less. But really, and uh, Dave, uh, Doug Hussman showed this, Irrigation is the most important thing, and you have to really irrigate the pouches and the augmentation bladders, and then you can prevent these things. But when it comes to the end and to discuss with the patients what would be a good solution, don't forget to talk to your patient about conduits. You have a couple of indications, and when you look at the conduits, the patient don't need to do a CIC. They are, have the bag, they don't need to change it, they can go to bars, they can drink, they are not related to the uh, CIC. And when you do a conduit in children or in the last hand, please remember colon segments have less complications than ileum segments. This is due because when you implant these segments in a growing child, uh, ileal segments get longer and longer. So colon segments, and also the uterus you can only implant without anti-reflex, they're always reflexive. Then you have a longer loop and uh, obstruction at the skin, at the fascia level, and then you end up with complication stage showing a middle a long time ago. So what are the take home measures? When you talk about these patients about surgical solutions, every, everything what is possible it should make sense for the patient. And you really have to adapt your renal diversion to the patient, not, not to your skills. And you should be able to manage all your complications. This is, I think, important. These patients, all of them, need a lifelong follow-up. Thank you for your attention. And I think we are now open for questions. Thank you, Raymond. Yes, that's enough. Turn off the screen share one second. Uh, there we go. So, yep, yeah, everyone's got videos on. Excellent. So, yeah, so just um, while we wait, hopefully we can take questions now. So, if people want to put their questions into um, the question chat field, that would be great. Um, while waiting for people to do that, uh, just a reminder that we're recording tonight's uh, webinar as usual, it'll be available tomorrow. Uh, on our YouTube channel, you can also access it straight after this webinar, about half an hour afterwards, through the GoTo webinar uh, system. Still, um, uh, you'll also get everyone attendees. You will get a survey after straight after this webinar. So if you can fill that in, we'd be most uh, grateful. Uh, helps us to we do look at all the feedback, and we will continue to try and improve these sessions. Um, okay, so we've got some questions. I did send them on to you, Bernard, earlier on. I think it was during your presentation. Uh, which was from Chris Garvis saying, what is your experience with the vaccines? Unless it's for somebody better. I don't, I don't know who would best to answer that. But uh. So um, I assume it's about the HPV vaccines and uh, we certainly recommend them to those patients, of course. And it's true, it's often forgotten in Austria. We have a regimen that they get it for free at the end of the primary school and that also concerns, of course, patients with spina bifida. But it's true that we often get questions whether they really should have it, and of course, they should have it. If other vaccines are in question, then um, please go further into detail. Yes, okay, and I'll just send something on to you. I do, Raymond, can you see the questions? I'll just send you, you've got three of them. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I can read them out, So, because I'm not sure who they're, best of four. So first one is, um, at what age, uh, what age ah, of children do you, sorry, um, at no. what age uh, for children do you indicate a euro, eurodynamic examination? Oh, we start very, very early with eurodynamics. Um, in those, I think we make a little bit of difference between those who were closed uh, intrauterine and those who were closed postnatally, I think it should be around three months between us, but when you have a newborn closed intrauterine, 
then you think within this next six to 12 weeks, you can make your dynamics and we start very early with this because the consequence would be if you see in the dynamics uh, hyperactivity and to the overactivity, then we would start with uh, oxybutynine and also we start very early with uh, introduction of intermittent catheterization in these kids. Okay. Um, the second question was, um, what is the preparation of, of the child before the urodyn urodynamic examination, um, prophylactic antibiotics, etc.? It's for you, Nina. So uh, we um, actually advise the parents to do a urine culture like seven to ten days before your dynamic examination and um, depending on the flora or the bacteria uh, shown in the urine culture and the number of bacteria we advise using um, antibiotic therapy starting like 48 hours before the examination yeah do you we think that we can provoke urinary tract infection, febrile fe urinary tract infection in, um, the, in children with uh, vesicular urethral reflux. And there can be um, like false overactivities in the urodynamic findings. So we recommend to, to therapy, for therapy. But we do not properly do, um, or actually do, like antibiotic prophylaxis in all patients. When they have sterile urinary culture, we don't do any antibiotics. Yeah. The, last, the last question is when I read it right, what do you consider to be a normal, uh, normal during a urinary examination in children? In the end, what is normal? We see also in the newborns quite some your dynamics where you have uh, no overactivity and at the end of the filling phase, which may be after 20, 30 mils, then you have a contraction, which may be even a normal Fetusa contraction. I think this would be a so-called normal urodynamic. In the older ones, as older the kids get, as less you see normal urodynamics. But a normal urodynamic would be one where you have really a quiet bladder without overactivity. And in the end of the filling phase, this uh, normal capacity or age related capacity, then you have to have a detrusor contraction and emptying the bladder. And I think this is a very rare condition in uh, neurogenic bladders. Okay, I think you should have some more questions there, Raymond. I'll just send on to you. So. Oh, okay, uh, here it comes. No, uh, the next one would be in newborns and infants, do you perform your dynamics under sedation? Uh, no, because I think if you do sedation or anything, you will disturb the normal inhalation of the bladder. And I think this is absolutely not necessary because especially in newborns or in small children, your dynamics of putting in the catheter is it's very easy. And they really accept it quite well, actually, mm. and they get used to it. And this is what we what we um, emphasize, and um, Bernard also emphasized that um, starting CIC very early, even if it's not that necessary, the the children really get used to it, and it makes urodynamics much easier for everyone, especially for the kids, because they are not stressed um, getting the catheter. And this this is really an, an also an important issue for the for the caregivers and the parents to to do maybe not that regular but constant CIC um, to to get the children get used to it. And it also makes follow up much easier if you have to take an eventual decision to start regular CIC or even to do a urodynamic exam, which what you have to do anyway. And then it's not not much of a problem. We use a TV to distract the ch older children and toys to distract the younger ones, and we never need it more, actually. The next question would be: Do you see a role for renal scintigraphy in assessing kidney function 
and when would you do it? Um, Bernhard, for you. I know I recommended when we wrote the EOA guidelines, we wrote that EMSA should be done as a baseline. And I think in Linz you are doing this too. What do you think about this? Well, we try to identify risk groups. And if there are patients who have a lot of UTIs, of course, it, it may help to ta tailor follow up. But as any exam, it should have an indication, I believe. So um, for adolescents, when you want to transition them, and there is an indication of renal insufficiency, which, which is not always easy to determine using creatinine or cystatine C, then I think DMSA is a good um, way of following them up. Or when there is a question for an indication for surgery, it may help to say there is an upper tract risk and you can assess it by DMSA, it may help your indication. And uh, we only routinely do it before transition for every patient. But otherwise, we only do it when there is risk. And the main risk is um, the history of UTI. But as I mentioned, uh, for example, Imamura showed that in 30% of those with relevant DMSA changes, there was no history of UTIs. And he uh, strongly advocates for doing it for everyone. And I think there is a point to that. Yeah, I think. In Mannheim, even writing these guidelines, we don't do a lot of scans, very, very rare. And as you said, there must be an indication. And I think even transition is not an indication because uh, when you have fibril UTIs and you think, then you may look if there are some scars and maybe if there's a reflux and there are scars, then you have to do something with the reflux because it's a, a high risk for the kidney. Also, when you have an obstruction, you want to know what the kidney function is and how severe this obstruction. When you have a dilatation, this really is. Or you think there may be an indication, but routinely doing scintigraphies, I think there's no role. Also, there's one question, do you see a role for renal scintigraphy in this in kidney function and when would you do it? Um, I think only when you uh, really have a consequence out of this then you would do it or you should do it. As I said, every investigation need a indication. Another thing, other question was, do you repeat your dynamics if the results is normal? Nina, what do you think? How often would you trust your, your dynamics? So um, we, we um, assess as well um, the clinical um, points we see, we want the parents to do protocols, how big the volumes are they in categorization and how the status of incontinence or continence is as well. So this is something additional. So we, we summarize everything and in the normal urodynamic, we repeat it um, at least once a year. And when there is really a stable situation, you can switch up to two years but you should um, be aware of like steps in life, like beginning puberty, and the, the intervals of the urodynamics shall be quite short again. Yeah, but you should see your patients regularly. So we, in, even if we have one up to two years intervals, we see our patients like every six to 12 months to do a clinical assessment as well with the ultrasound. And yeah. Bernhard, one nice question for you. Do you always use hydrophilic urinary catheters for CIC? As you also go to Africa, for example, what do you think about how should be a catheter? I know that when you look at the studies and the meta-analysis, there is no big differences between which catheter you use. Also, there's no big difference how often you should use a catheter, but what is your impression and daily life? Well, daily life in Linz is, of course, hydrophilic catheters uh, for single use. But um, actually, if in, in, in poorer countries, catheters with gel for multiple use are a big advantage. Hydrophilic catheters, if they dry out, they stick a lot. 
and um, especially in Eastern Africa. And, and, it, and it's difficult to use them repeatedly because then they stick faster and it's easier to use those um, that have that gel inside or to give them a lot of gel for repeated use. And what we did in Africa and what is done in Africa um, is to use metal catheters. And actually, especially for stomas and for girls, they work really great. You can wash them, you can cook them, and uh, all of those kids, when they come for follow up, there are no UTIs. It's impressive. Yeah, this is an important issue actually, seeing ecological and environmental um, issues. So, um, there are studies showing that there is no problem using um, the catheters, especially when you're being at home in your normal environment using them quite often, not like 20 times, but like one day you can use the same catheter again and again. And um, this will be a very important issue for us in the future, seeing uh, I uh, concerning our uh, environmental aspects as well. There's one last question. What, at what age do you perform surgery, uh, stoma or bladder neck reconstruction? I think we in Mannheim, we really stick on this. We do it only when the patient is willing to do the CIC and only in these cases. Otherwise, you may have an incontinent vesicostomy because it's uh, also it may help to facilitate the CIC for the caregivers or parents. But usually we do really continent surgery only in those who are really willing to do this and they are proof to do this. So uh, I think when you do a continent stoma or bladder neck surgery in a uh, adolescent or in a younger child who is not willing to do the CIC, you create problems and problems. What is your impression, Bernhard? I think. Yes, same, same for us. And I think uh, you need a strong partner meaning a child who really wants to get dry and then things are much easier also in the period operative um, um, course and, and of course in follow-up. It's the same, same for us. And they, they can take longer, they can take until they're 10, 12, 13 and there are often very complex family dynamics involved as well. Um, and I think we have to take a closer look at all of this if you want to provide them with the best possible care. Also in in terms of looking at renal function impairment, which occurs often when you change something about the ur ur um, urinary tract, and then there is not a good compliance afterwards. This was fortunately the last question, and we are a little bit running out of time, Darren, I think. I don't know. Yeah, that was the last, last question we have at the moment. So I think given it's ten part, nearly 10 past seven, if we um, kind of end things there, I'm going to say quickly, if anybody else does have a question, they haven't had time to type in or think about it afterwards, you have my email address. So please send the question to me. I shall pass it on to the presenters. Um, so thank you to all the attendees. As I mentioned, you'll get a, sorry, one second, you'll get a um, survey at the end of this. If you feel like it would be great. Um, please check our website for future webinars. Other than that, I'll say thank you to all our presenters today. Very much uh, appreciated taking the time to do this. And um, Hopefully see everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, for organizing all this. And thank you, thank Michelle. You. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Good night. Thank you.